up a unicorn here with Appendix E. In the last year of Malcolm X, The Evolution of a Revolutionary by George Whitman, this is the final presentation of the reading here. Um, so remember in Appendix uh, B, C, D, we were reading the writing of someone else. Well, this appendix is actually written by the author again. He wraps it up. He begins with his own writing and ends with his own writing. So this is his um, writing on the first anniversary of the death of Malcolm X. I am having a very warm drink. Hi, Kailata. Um, oh my goodness, one of my favorite usernames, Feminism Weave and Single Mothers. Um, thank you for joining me. I appreciate that you're here. If you guys could please like the video, I would appreciate that so much. So <clears throat> it reads, um, those who arranged the assassination of Malcolm X because they could not answer, frighten, buy, or corrupt him, wanted not only to silence his voice, but to prevent the consolidation of a new movement that would seriously threaten their power and privileges. It would have been foolish a year ago. It would have been foolish now to pretend that the assassination was anything but a calamitous blow to the freedom struggle and radical movements of this country. The assassination removed the man who was best equipped to build and lead the kind of movement that will meet the immediate needs of black people and the ultimate needs of all working people. We could console ourselves by saying that his place would be filled eventually by others because that is true, but it did not alter the fact that meanwhile, our cause had suffered a crippling setback. But we should not go to the other extreme and make the mistake of thinking that our enemies achieved everything they wanted to. Their aim was not only to kill Malcolm, but to kill his ideas. Their intention was not only to end his life, but to end his influence. They wanted him not only dead, but discredited and forgotten. No one could be positive a year ago that they would not succeed in this second aim too. Now, after a year, I think the answer can be given with certainty. They have not succeeded. The effort to discredit, him, to discredit him has failed. He is not forgotten and more people have begun to understand his ideas, to understand them more accurately than the last year of his life. Malcolm X, the man has been dead for a year, but the truths that he uttered and the example that he set are still marching on. With all of its power, the enemy has not been able to prevent those truths from reaching more and more people, black and white. That is what I want to demonstrate and document tonight. Malcolm's body had still not been buried when a black lackey of the white ruling class, Carl Rowan, tried to earn some of his pay as director of the United States Misinformation Agency. Waving newspaper articles from all over the world, Rowan complained bitterly that they were misrepresenting the significance of a man who was only an ex-convict, ex-dope peddler who became a racial fanatic. Rowan was not content to have Malcolm dead. He felt a necessity to bespatter his image and consign him to disgraceful oblivion. That wasn't, that wasn't only Roman talking. That was the government, the national government of the ruling class that was not satisfied with Malcolm dead physically, but wanted him dead morally as well. The same position was taken by the press of this ruling class. In the last pages of his autobiography, Malcolm had predicted that when he was dead, the press was going to smear and distort his effort to open a new road for the Negro struggle. And the New York Times, the outstanding big, big business paper in this country, fulfilled Malcolm's prediction to the hilt the very day he was assassinated, rushing to print with an editorial whose malice and bias it would be hard to match. The Times editorial called Malcolm a case history, a twisted man who turned many true gifts to evil purpose. 
had a ruthless fanatical belief in violence, did not seek to fit into society or into the life of his own people, saw the world in distorted fashion and was killed by someone who came out of the darkness that he spawned. It is probable that the authors of this editorial were so carried away by the passion of their hatred for Malcolm and what he represented that they overshot the mark and actually defeated their own purpose. But the purpose was plain, to destroy Malcolm's influence and prestige as thoroughly as the assassin's bullets destroyed the man. And the liberals who preached to the ruling class but generally accept its basic estimates and outlook were not much better. The liberal magazine, The Nation, began its March 8 editorial on the assassination with the statement, Malcolm X was highly intelligent, was, a, was the highly intelligent, courageous leader of one segment of the Negro lunatic French. Ain't that a... The lesson it drew was that the government should perceive to remove discriminatory boundaries, barriers, and thus prevent people from adhering to Malcolm's cause, which it called defeatist and mistaken. The editorial ended by saying that if the government would do that, then Malcolm will in the long run have done great service not only to the Negroes, but to all Americans, even though he was the leader of a lunatic fringe, which as any liberal knows, must be shunned and isolated. What a grotesque thing to say about Malcolm. But something has happened since those editorials were printed, something unexpected by the men who wrote them in February and March. Around the end of October, less than four months ago, two books by and about Malcolm X were published, The Autobiography and Malcolm X Speaks, a collection of speeches and statements from his last year. And these became the means for registering what had happened to Malcolm's reputation and standing during the seven or eight months after his death. You have heard what the editors of the Times said and wanted people to believe in February. But on November 5th, they printed a review of the autobiography by a member of their staff. And lo and behold, it's not along, it's not along quite the same lines as their February 22nd editorial. The reviewer is Elliot Fremont Smith, and he begins as follows. It is probably fair to say that the majority of the public regards Malcolm X as a violence preaching black Muslim racial agitator who reaped his own body, who reaped his own bloody end. He then adds, and this is what the new, and this is what is new for the times. There is, however, another view of Malcolm X, one that is increasingly prevalent among civil rights advocates, that with his death, American Negroes lost their most able, articulate, and compelling spokesman. Fremont Smith doesn't take sides in favor of this increasingly prevalent view and against the view fostered by his bosses. He says only both views represent parts of the truth. But now at least the so-called part of the truth that was completely absent from the February editorial is getting a certain amount of airing and hearing. Fremont Smith notes now that in the last year of his life, he radically modified certain of his ideas and began to take an active role in the securing of Negro rights within, not apart from American society. He continues how important a spokesman he could have been for the American Negro had he lived, Negroes had he lived remains in doubt. At any rate, this raises a doubt about the position of the Times editors who showed no doubts whatsoever. Fremont Smith casts further doubts on their position when he says, as this extraordinary autobiography shows, the source of Malcolm X's power was not alone in its intelligence, energy, electric personality, or ability to grow and change. Remarkable as these were, its source was that he understood perhaps more profoundly than any other Negro leader the full shocking extent of America's psychological destruction of its Negroes, which he calls an almost automatic function of white society. Come on, somebody. The point I am trying to make is that the authors of that scurrilous Times editorial in February could not have foreseen that in November they would have had to print an article so much at variance with their own prejudices. This was not because the Times editors have changed or have reformed, have become more honest, but because the atmosphere has changed. 
They simply could not get away in November with the kind of falsification that they thought possible in February. Too many people are learning the truth and the editors have been forced to readjust a little. The editors of The Nation suffered a somewhat similar fate. In March, they had belittled Malcolm as the leader of a lunatic fringe, but on November 8th, they printed a review of the autobiography by Truman Nelson, which began by saying, this is the story of a man struck down on his way to becoming a revolutionary and a liberator of his people. Nothing about lunatic fringes. And near the end, Nelson says of Malcolm, after his final return from Africa in the autumn 1964, I heard him in Harlem on a platform with Babu, the Zanzibar revolutionary, say the problem is now simply the oppressed against the oppressor. He had begun to renew himself and his regenerated purpose began to take form, a political form. He was talking now like a member of the revolutionary majority. Talking like a member of the revolutionary majority probably strikes some of the nation editors as lunatic stuff too, but they're not saying that now. Earlier in the September 20th nation, Harvey Swaddle's writing about the radical parties in this country expressed the conviction that Malcolm did have a remarkable capacity for political growth, which he said many white liberals refused to recognize, perhaps because it is a capacity that is foreign to them. This is true. Most white liberals lack that capacity. So do black liberals, even black liberals who call themselves radicals or social democrats like Bain or Rustin. But even in Rustin, we have witnessed a certain change during the months we have been examining, a change which can be explained only by a change in the prevailing intellectual atmosphere. Rustin and Malcolm were political opponents because Rustin favors sidetracking the Negro struggle into the Democratic Party and uses the most radical sounding arguments to justify this policy, while Malcolm called this policy what it is. Political Uncle Tomism. Immediately after the assassination, Rustin and Tom Kahn did what a hatchet job did a hatchet job on Malcolm, printed in Dissent and Amer and, and in New America. So Dissent is the name of a paper, and New America is the name of a paper. I want to make that clear as I continue reading. Rustin and Tom Kahn did a hatchet job on Malcolm, printed in Dissent and New America, an article designed to cut Malcolm down so that no young militant would ever look in his direction for guidance or inspiration. After the autobiography appeared, however, Rustin reviewed it in November 14th, book week. Now Rustin too had to sing a slightly different tune, had to show a little more respect for Malcolm, the man. And even though he continued to belittle his achievement and confuse his evolution by garbling together Malcolm's positions on important questions from different and conflicting periods of his life. Having a, pet, having a capacity for growth that is lacking among most liberals, some radicals have been able to learn things in the years since Malcolm's death. An example is Emile Capoya, who reviewed Malcolm's autobiography and a book by Elijah Muhammad in the Saturday Review of November 20th. I think it is worth quoting because Capoya is both honest and independent. Capoya discusses his attitude to Malcolm during his lifetime, which he supposes represents the majority opinion still. He says, and I'm drinking my coffee, excuse me. As long as he was a follower of Elijah Muhammad, I was repelled by what I knew of his economic and social program, his irreconcilable attitude towards whites, the puritanism of the Nation of Islam's moral do uh, doctrines, and the bad grammar of the sex newspaper, Muhammad speaks. <clears throat> The black Muslim demand for a separate state within the United States are regarded as a piece of cynical demagog demagoguery or perhaps plain foolishness. What it came down to is that Malcolm X was talking revolution, his own variety, and since that was not the same as mine, I could fall back on all the familiar excuses for not using my imagination. When Malcolm X parted company with Elijah Muhammad, made his pilgrimage to Mecca, returned bearing a more conciliatory racial message, and began to involve himself in direct political activity, I grew slightly more sympathetic. Now that he is dead, and the social forces to which he gave expression are for the moment thwarted, I can see how badly I misjudged the man in the movement. It has taken me a long time, but I begin to see why many Negro intellectuals and radicals, black and white, were so impressed by him, applauded his intransigence while he was alive and felt personally diminished by his death. Right now in this country, every man stands between the devil and the deep blue sea. 
The ideals we profess as a people have scarcely any other function than to color greed at home and violence abroad. We are in an amoral and political crisis. Almost alone, Malcolm knew it and declared it. His doctrine was cast in terms of race, but that was very nearly an accident. Elsewhere in the review, Kapoya makes the correct point that class questions are often expressed in racial terms. Much the same thing that happened to Emil Kapoya has been happening to other people, especially student rebels. Donald Stanley, reviewing the autobiography in October 4th, San Francisco Examiner writes, one of the really surprising things that's happening is the spreading of the legend that late black Muslim leader whose influence has failed to stop at graveside. Malcolm's ghost is walking today alongside not only the blacks engaged in their fight for rights and equality, but it insinuates itself more and more frequently into such non-racial student movements as those which animate Berkeley. Most of the changed opinions about Malcolm that have been reporting up to now have been by white people, not black. That is because there has been little or no change in black people's opinions without hearing everything Malcolm had said, without knowing whether he had altered his views on this or that question. The masses of black people sensed, felt, and knew that he was speaking for them all the time and to them most of the time. They knew that unlike most Negro leaders, he could not be bought. Foolish white liberals like Robert Penn Warren could say in his book, Who Speaks for Who Speaks for the Negro, that Malcolm may end at the barricades or in Congress, or he might end on the board of a bank. But the black masses knew before the assassination that Malcolm would never sell out. And the assassination only confirmed this conviction. Middle class Negroes, the moderates and liberals are keenly aware of what the masses think about Malcolm. That is why despite their hostility toward almost everything he represented, they have been careful about the way that they speak and write about him. More careful, for example, than Bayard Rustin or Carl Rowan, whose main audience is not the Negro mass masses. When we examine Malcolm's standing in the black community, we come to something apparently paradoxical. Malcolm was a black nationalist in the first months after he left the black Muslims and he was pure and simple black nationalist. And in his final months, he was something more than that. He was a black nationalist plus social revolutionist, although he had then begun to have doubts about the black nationalist label. Now black nationalism, this doctrine or ideology or tendency which with which the name of Malcolm was and is associated, had reached the height of its popularity in the black community from 1962 until, the, until around the middle of 1964. Many more people called themselves black nationalists during that period than ever before. Black nationalists were so confident in those years, they felt the wind was in their sails, but around the middle of 1964, something happened that changed the situation. I think it was the nomination of Goldwater, which, persisted, which precipitated a crisis a political dilemma in black nationalist circles. I cannot go into that here, but I think I could show that whatever the reason was, a change did begin to take place then amongst most of the people who considered themselves black nationalists. Some of the steam began to go out of them. Some of them stopped calling themselves black nationalists. Confusion set in, morale failed. This was noticeably the case after the assassination of Malcolm X. The man so many people had counted on to lead in the formation of the new nationwide black nationalist movement. And yet this is the paradoxical part. While organizationally, the black nationalist tendency has suffered serious setbacks in the last year or two, ideologically, its influence has spread far, wide, and deep. It is as though it was locked out of the door and came creeping in the window. For today, many of the ideas, demands, and slogans originated by black nationalists in 1962, 63, and 64, ideas, demands, and slogans associated with the public mind, all with Malcolm X, are common coin in most of the black community and even in many of the civil rights organizations that didn't want to touch Malcolm with a 10-foot pole. Malcolm is dead and the movement he wanted to build has not grown or prospered organizationally, but many of their ideas, their ideas, black leadership, black power, building a base in the ghetto, control of the ghetto, self-defense, racial plight, solidarity, identification with the colonial revolution in Africa, independent black political action, these and other concepts, which were considered the unique attributes of black nationalism in Malcolm X two years ago, are now generally accepted in the black community or they are not argued about 
or at the very least, they are given lip service even by civil rights organizations that repudiated and denounced them not long ago. The continued spread of Malcolm's ideas can be illustrated by two of the major developments of the last year, Watts and the movement against the war in Vietnam. Malcolm predicted Watts and probably would have been blamed. And by Watts, they mean the Watts riots, all right? Malcolm predicted Watts and probably would have been blamed for it if he had lived. He predicted that 1965 would be the biggest explosion yet. He predicted that 1965 would see the biggest explosion yet. And Watts was certainly the biggest and most explosive demonstration against racial oppression of our time. Malcolm did not call such explosion race riots. He used the words pogrom to describe the Harlem events of 1964. And he would have concurred with the youth of Watts who called their uprising a revolt, not a riot. A revolt, not a riot. Even the most obtuse commentators on the Watts event were compelled to recognize the basically black nationalist and potentially revolutionary character of the Watts uprising, which is only another way of saying it's Malcolmite character. In the 1964 struggle, the people of Harlem who booed Baynard Rustin and James Farmer shouted, we want Malcolm. They did not do that in Watts in 1965, but in essence, the people of Watts were shouting through their actions for a leadership with the integrity, integrity and intransigence of Malcolm. Malcolm died just around the time of the first major escalation of the counter-revolutionary war against the people of Vietnam, and only eight weeks before the April March on Washington where the present anti-war movement was born but he had been speaking out against the United States government's war from the beginning. He spoke out against it long before Martin Luther King and without any equivocation about where his sympathies lay. He spoke out against it in the spirit of the best and strongest parts of the last month's anti-war statement by SNCC, SNCC, and would surely have supported the anti-war demonstrations scheduled to take place in the South this weekend. William Worthy reported in the November 20th National Guardian that during the International Days of Protest Rally in Berkeley on October, October 16th, one speaker on the Sound Truth remarked to another, has it occurred to you that if Malcolm X had not been assassinated last February, he would undoubtedly be speaking here today at one of, another, one of the other big demonstrations? His presence would have had an added import and added important extra dimension to the protest. He could have also said with equal accuracy that Malcolm was one of the influence that had helped to educate and inspire many of the thousands of young people who came out into the streets that day. Malcolm placed his greatest hopes in young people, in students. He would have felt his hopes were being confirmed by the rise of the present anti-war movement, and he would have reached out the hand of solidarity towards it. In the summer issue of Dissent, the social democratic magazine, which some people are beginning to call Ascent, Irving Howe, its editor, claimed that he had heard Malcolm say at a meeting that he would go not unarmed to Mississippi if the Negroes there would ask him to come. A condition that could only leave him safely north, since the last thing the Negroes of Mississippi needed or wanted was Malcolm's military aid. Since this was a misrepresentation both of what Malcolm had said and of sentiment in the South, I wrote dissent a letter pointing out that Malcolm did not remain, quote unquote, safely north, but went to Alabama and spoke there twice in the last month of his life, getting an enthusiastic reception from the Selma students, um, as in Selma, Alabama, y'all, and was scheduled to speak in Mississippi the weekend he was killed. And I added that the spread of the deacons of defense, shout out DOD, and I added that the spread of the deacons for defense and justice into Mississippi indicates that Howe is not speaking for all Mississippi's Negroes when he says they don't need or want Malcolm's position on self-defense. Howe replied, 
in the autumn issue that he would not argue about what Malcolm had said, but insisted that it would not do to invoke the deacons as an example of what Malcolm was advocating. For that group, whatever judgment one may make of its methods is involved with part of the civil rights movement. It works together with core. It does not, as Malcolm did, talk violence and practice abstentionism. Now, the question is not whether Malcolm was willing to work together with CORE on certain projects. Of course he was willing. They were the ones who were unwilling. They were the ones who were unwilling. CORE was unwilling. The question is, are the deacons of defense, are the deacons the kind of self-defense movement Malcolm advocated, or aren't they? I think the answer is that they are that Howe was trying to create distinction that doesn't exist in reality as part of his tendencies, persistent effort to cut Malcolm down. But if anyone doesn't agree, I would offer the testimony of the deacons themselves. And particularly, I would offer the testimony of Henry Austin, a young man who joined the deacons of defense in Bogulsa last year, around the time Malcolm was killed. Austin is out on bond and faces trial with a possible 10 year prison sentence for shooting a racist, a racist assailant in self-defense during a civil rights march in Bogulsa last July. Excuse me, in Bogalusa last July. Here are some of the things Henry Austin said as reported in the November 22nd article belonging to the militant. The deacons, have given the Negro throughout the nation an organization they can point to with dignity. There is no dignity in the nonviolent march. There is no dignity when a Negro woman is attacked. The attackers have no respect for the nonviolent. They patted Dr. King on the head when he used nonviolence in Alabama. In Alabama. If nonviolence is such a good thing, why don't we have a nonviolent army in Vietnam? When King condemned the deacons for using violence and defending Negroes, lives, and property, they gave him a Nobel Prize. When Dr. King condemned me for shooting a white racist, they called him a responsible leader. When King condemned the U.S. for armed intervention in Vietnam, they said Dr. King had stopped being responsible and had gone into meddling. If violence is right in Vietnam, then surely violence is right in Mississippi. If violence can be a righteous tool for the white man, then surely it can be just as righteous a tool for the black man. If violence can be used to murder defenseless women and children in Vietnam, then certainly it can be used in Louisiana to defend Negroes' lives and property. It seems funny to me that they want me to fight in Viet Cong when the Viet Cong never called me nigger. Whose voice does that resemble if not Malcolm's? even though it comes from a young man who didn't become active until Malcolm was dead. So it is not at all surprising to hear Henry Austin continue in that militant in interview and say, Malcolm X is my idol. Malcolm had not yet reached his peak, but I believe he was on the right road. The road I'm on is the one I think he was on. I think he believed that the black man in America had to unite and stand up. I think this is what he was trying to do, unite the Negroes. He once said, freedom by any means necessary, which I made my motto. I hope it will be the motto of the entire black mass of this country. So Malcolm's ideas have been spreading since his death in the South as well as in the North, not only his ideas on the specific question of self-defense, but his whole outlook, his whole outlook, which was summed up in the model, the model the Henry Austins have chosen, and I hope will become the model of all black people in this country. They are taking root and spreading, especially among the young people, those in their twenties and late teens and younger even than that. I want to conclude my documentation by citing a recent incident as encouraging its way as Henry Austin's remarks an example. There is a Saturday afternoon TV program in New York called Speak Out, which is conducted by Sony Fox over station WNEW TV. Sarah Slack reported in the November 20th Amsterdam News that 40 high school students were on that program discussing the questions, who are your heroes and why are they your heroes? 
The expected answers, the expected answers were indicated by a row of blown up photographs that they had on display. Pictures of John F. Kennedy, John Glenn, John Wayne, Lyndon Johnson, and others of that type. To the probable surprise of the authorities, one student described in the article as a clean cut American teenage Negro boy said, Malcolm X, more than any other individual, helped the Negro race, raised the image of itself, raised the image of itself. And he more than any other helped the Negro show more pride in being a Negro. Another youth, a white one this time said, Malcolm X is a hero to me because he stood up like a man and fought so strongly for his beliefs. Malcolm X did not run over anybody to get him to believe as he did. He simply talked and those who want to believe him did so. And a young girl who was also white said, Malcolm X fought what he believed in. It is right for a person to fight for his beliefs. I am not sure about the accuracy of the saying about what comes out of the mouths of babes, but I do believe that what comes out of the mouths of teenagers is significant, for they are the next generation, the one just around the corner, who will be heard before the 1960s have ended. And when the truth has taken root among people still in junior high and high school, when they have been able to pierce through the anti-Malcolm propaganda and brainwashing and to identify with him black and white, then I think we have every reason to believe that the propagandists and brainwashers of the ruling classes have failed. And that Malcolm's place in history will be as high and honorable as his influence on the next revolutionary generation will be strong and productive. That's the end of Appendix E. <laughs> If you missed any of this book, it's on a playlist called Books. I'm not the best reader. I'm not the best speaker. But I feel that it is important to buy the book, read the book, or at least listen to the book. This is an American patriot. He's our pride in his Afro-American manhood. He deserves as much from us in his grave. If you miss something, please play the book. Not for my channel, not for, just, just for him, for Malcolm. I'm uppity, unicorn, and I'm out of here.